Welcome guys, this week's episode of Heavy Metal Tones with me, your podcast host, Tony Evans. Um, uh, this is a, a format I haven't done for a little while. This is an album review or chit-chat about an album. I don't want to say it's a review because um, that means it could be positives, it could be negatives. I just want to talk about the album. Uh, and this comes about after me listening to a podcast recently, uh, Rock on Tours, which I love. Um, and it had Paul Simonon on it, the bass player from The Clash. And I'd been going through a bit of a uh, in and out phase with Clash for most of my adult life. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm in a Clash moment now. And um, so I thought, hmm, I might mention, let's talk about one of those on the show this week. Hang on. Tea time already. And uh, I thought, well, yeah, okay. So what album? And I, you know, then, you know, not a huge, vast catalogue of albums to play with. Could I go the first album? Could I go, you know, um, later albums? And I thought, you know, I'm going to go the one that everyone will know, but everyone has has such a diverse opinions about. Uh, and I'm thinking with the troubling third album, uh, sandwiched between the first album and uh, and, and uh, enough rope. Uh, so after enough rope and built before the terrible, terrible decision they made when they made Sandinista. Now the people out there who might absolutely love uh, Sandinista. I personally can't abide the album. But um, before that album came this one, which is London Calling. Now, those out there who don't know, uh, who are putting their hands up and saying, but Tone, Tone, who are The Clash? Well, a quick potted history. Um, the Clash are a founding punk band from the uh, burgeoning UK punk scene. Uh, founded in around about 76 through to 79 um, around 80 sort of period in the UK they were the more uh, political of the movement at that time I mean the pistols were political but they were more socio-economical you know what I mean uh, whereas the punk uh, whereas the clash was more um, really sort of right on fists in the hand yeah um, picket line kind of band um and that comes purely because of Joe Strummer's uh, sort of, I think his love of um, Bob Dylan and protest music and, and and so forth, you know, more more than anything else. Um, I think he was the one that drove that band in that direction. I'm sure that Mick Jones will say that he had a bit of a, a thing to do with it, but I think Mick Jones just liked rock and roll really, and wanted to be in a band and play music was. Um, Joe Strummer was more wanted to change the world. Don't get me wrong, Mick Jones may have wanted to change the world. I, I can't speak for him, um, of course, but um, that's my that's the feeling I get. Anyway, they're the punk band, so they they were um, from several different bands: London SS and um, all sorts of and other um, um, uh, bands around London uh, when the punk movement exploded, and they formed. They came together and formed the Clash. I mean, I'm going to, and they signed to CBS, which was a massive problem uh, with the eth ethos and ethics of the punk movement, because they believed that the you know the hardcore member Kunyan Senti of the uh, movement believed that uh, you shouldn't be there for making money. It was a it was a uh, a war sign to big labels because it was about pulling down and tearing down the walls of. Of hypocrisy of, of, of the of hypocrisy sorry of the state and of the music industry and recreating all you know like dadaism like um bauhaus it was all about an art movement really even though it wasn't an art movement it was an art movement um you know they'll tell you i mean john lyden will tell you it wasn't to do with art it was to do with passion and warf and, and, and aggression and and and, and just wanting to be different but it was an art movement uh, clearly it was all music is art so therefore it's an art movement um so they they were really the fans really really got sort of turned off by by the the clash i mean um the the, the irony of that is that even though the clash signed with cbs um they didn't really make that much money um, yeah, it was, they signed for eighty thousand pounds back in seventy not oh seventy seven seventy eight. I, I got to check into that, but around that period. Now, 
that's you know today that's pennies but if you extrapolate that that's millions of pounds in today's um economy but it wasn't that much and and the albums that they made where they were big um they weren't huge i mean they didn't they weren't massive in america which is where you need to be to make the money until this album um of course uh, in fact not until really um combat rock uh which was much more radio accessible album uh, you know the first album was a pure angry um stamp in the sand um this is us uh spit of vitriol and anger and rage and and um and rock and roll and and, and the breakdown of rock and roll uh, into its very visceral parts and then reassembling into um, a, a more um, youth orientated um, anyone can do it ethos music form um, the, the they didn't really make that much money um, because they firstly uh, would tour relentlessly which costs money um, of course, also record deals back then, even though they signed £80,000, it wasn't like it is now where you get lawyers scrupulously looking at the contract. So they would probably got not much of that money, which is really sad when you think about who they are. Um, I don't think that Mick Jones really made any money, really, until he, jo- he formed Big Audio Dynamite. And I don't think that um, Topper Heaton on drums really did anything either. I mean, I think if I look, you know, if you look at... Um, uh, Someone like Paul Simonon. I mean, Paul Simonon, as we talked about earlier, I think really he, he didn't make his big bucks until much later in life, I don't think. You know, when he's with... Um, he, he did a lot with the gorillas and, and things like that. Anyway, that aside, I'm getting sidetracked. So it's the, it was it's a difficult third album. And a lot of bands have difficult third albums, don't they? It seems to me that the first album, as I've mentioned before on this podcast, is the one where... You know, it's like the it's like the going out the gates. It's like the running down the road. The first few meters, you've you've done this before so many times. You know how to do it. Here you go. Second one is oh, I'm suddenly sort of getting a bit sort of uh, not quite sure here. Okay, I've still got a little bit of the previous album. This keep moving. I've got we we'll use material from the first second album. Third album is okay. Right now we have to have ideas again. And sometimes those ideas they run well, and sometimes they fall flat. Uh, not so much the case with London's Calling. London Calling was released um, it was in 1979 on CBS, January 1980 in the USA and February, uh, sorry, December the 14th in the UK. In fact, it's CBS in the UK and, uh, sorry, Epic Records in America. It recorded at the sadly now gone and wonderful Wessex Studios where everyone recorded Bowie and Rec, T-Rex and Queen and the Pistols and Marillion, in fact, everyone. I mean, everyone recorded there. Um, he had several singles from it. Um, on the 7th of December, London Calling, reaching number 11, number 11 in the charts. Uh, the band's highest reaching chart single until 10 years after that, when... Um, when Should I Stay or Should I Go from Combat Rock made it to number one. Which is incredible when you think how many amazing singles they have released and how many songs they re- recorded, which, I mean, had they not been um, attacking the system and anti-authoritarian, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and all that sort of jazz, they would have probably got many top five singles. But... Um, no, they didn't. And again, did, I don't think. I mean, deep down, of course, if you sat down with Mick Jones and Paul Simonon and and uh, and Joe Strummer and Topper Heaton and said, "Hey, do you want a number one single?" Back in seventy nine, seventy seven, of course they would have said yes. To say no would be churlish. You know, even with all the punk ethos, you still got to live. You still got to make money. You still got to survive. And the number one singles make you money, don't they? Anyway, um, so three singles off it. Uh, London Calling, uh, Clamp Down, which was only released here in Australia as a single, which I only did not know that, actually, until researching this album. Um, I really didn't know that, and I thought I knew my uh, my Clash singles, and uh, I'm sure, I mean, I 
I just shocked me that I didn't know that. Anyway, it uh, was released in some parts of America on, on compilations, but it was only released in Australia as a single uh, uh, with the backs, uh, the B-side of Guns of Brixton, with Paul Simon and so on, which we'll talk about later on. And then the final single, Train in Vain, which is considered by many to be their greatest single. Uh, and it's also, it reached um, 218 in the top 500 greatest singles of all time on, on the Rolling Stones rock and rock list, top rock list of, of uh, singles of all time. Um, it's interesting how, and Train in Vain has also got this sort of um, brackets, close, open brackets, uh, stand by me, close brackets, because it does, we'll get to that in a minute, but it does sound a, a lot like um, Stand By Me. Now, they wrote this album in a period of writer's block, so between August and November of 79. As I said before, it's that troublesome third album uh, where um, I think also where the band got their writer's block is because punk, and you know I love punk, punk is a wonderful thing. It's a, It's the true fire of rock and roll it's the true um bastard child of uh, eddie cochran and buddy holly and the elvis and rock and roll it's the true real or true progenitor of what would happen if those those people had children if that musical format a child rock and punk would be it when it grew up to become a teenager it's the teenage years of rock and roll if you think about it because the rock and roll is the 50s um, you fall in the 60s, teenagers in the 70s, right? So rock and punk is the teenage years of rock and roll. Um, and like all teenagers, most of them, most of us, we realise that it is limiting to uh, shake your fist, shout and, and jump up and down because you don't get anywhere after a while. And also um, you get bored of doing it. And I think what happened with the third album particularly with this album, it's a classic example of this, is that the punk movement limited itself so quickly with its own boundaries, even though it said it was boundless, it had its own boundaries and its own written rules and its own um, niche ideas. And within that, t within those small boundaries, niche ideas and themes, you become restricted. And, and unless you do something different all you're going to do is that thing for the rest of your career and that's um a mind-numbingly boring for the artists but also really uninspiring for us listeners so the medium and the and the and the format had to change um, and it did of course it evolved into new wave and then offshoots like scar and so on um, but new wave was you know, is that slightly older teenager, right? That moving into their moving, moving out of home and getting uh, a first relationship kind of of teenager, uh, but it, it feels a bit more intelligent because it's now going to college, right? It's not just banging on the door asking for money, and you know, asking his parents for money, I should say. So, you know, what I think when Mick Jones and and Strummer were sitting down, and Paul Simonon was and and uh, uh, Top Hedron was sitting down, they were like. Okay, I really. What? Where do we go? Where do we take this to its logical conclusion? And um, I think they would have gone in round in circles to to make an album that still had the punk direction and ethos, to, so it, it could maintain most of its customer, its, its fan base, but at the same time, try and. Um, satisfy the the artists themselves in their own way as I said because how boring would it be to write the same thing over and over and over again I mean if you were if you were doing that you you really would be Kiss wouldn't you um or ACDC or any of those bands where they've got their sound and that's what they do now for them they might love doing it it's fine they love it and go on with it you know or stay as quo or something like that you know but and I love quo and I love ACDC and I like bits of kiss you know whatever but it would be very boring to keep doing that for year after year so I think the also one of the signs of punk what people forget is people look at punk and they think um Mohicans, piercings, idiots, 
fighting stupid people uh, like you know like the image that people get of headbangers that were all you know um, all uh, Vivians of this world from the young ones but we're not and neither were punks a lot of punks were actually intelligent like if you look at the bands that moved from the movement like Wire and a flux of Pink Indians and um, The Clash and uh, you know XTC I could name loads um, that you know Elvis Costello uh, to name a few um, that really were quite intelligent The Jam um, that had a social uh, stranglers that had things to say they weren't just you know creating violence like people had this image that we were as punks when, and I was one and I still am really deep down um, you know no there was an intelligence to it there was an intelligent side to it and I think this is why I said why I think that this third album was tricky for them now because this album itself uh, if you look at the genres that come out of this album it's a mix of punk reggae rockabilly ska R&B pop lounge jazz which is an interesting one and hard rock so it's really it's a bit of everything and that makes it so punk it's ridiculous because it is so a bit of everything uh, it is tearing everything down restarting changing being different so what do we get we get a double album we get a double album with an iconic cover of Paul Simonham smashing his bass which I found out in an interview with him was not his second bass it was his only bass at the time it wasn't like um, he was being sponsored and he could just smash his basses as I said these weren't making a lot of money these people right they were doing better than people on the doll yeah of course they were uh, or people want to check out or whatever but they still weren't getting as much money as everyone thinks they would be and that's true these days now right but anyway um, anyhow, it's a cover of that. It's you know the lovely the lyric. The, it's a sort of like it's copying the Elvis cover with the writing down the left hand side in pink and green along the bottom and so on. It it is it, it's a double album again, really daring, really daring. I mean they then when I did a four album with a four I think it's four with Sandinista, which is I said was like you know a little bit too much up their own sphinx to that one, but this one was quite daring because I think in some territories it was cut down to a single album releasing two single albums but everywhere else it was a double album um, asking a punk audience or a new wave audience as it was sort of gradually becoming then to set their attention span to two vinyl or four vinyl sides this is this is a this is a, an audience that was vastly bred on only buying singles very rarely did punks buy the album. They would buy the singles, move on. That's why the punk um, single collectors market is so huge. I mean, I was just looking for a book on the weekend about punk covers, and I was like, oh my god, that one, I've got that one, that one, that one, that one. I was looking at these album covers, single covers, and thinking, I'd rather have all these singles and all these al than the albums, because um, a lot of the time, punk singles were. Um, a flash in the pan but those moments that three minute that two minute that one and a half minute um, moment on vinyl uh, was more passionate and powerful than a whole swathes of albums um, playing for 35 40 minutes so again brave right four sides um, I have to tell you that playing this album back again I lost my attention span here and there, uh, not because I can't listen to double albums. I'm a lover of prog, as you know. I don't. That's not an issue. I just felt that this album um, could have been and should have been probably split up and material over two albums. I think they would. They were really trying to um, give value for money and get all their ideas out in one go. Because I think also probably they probably thought this was it. We're done now. Once we do this, we're done. I can't see how this can go any further. Um, which I can understand. I mean, a lot of the punk, punk thing was quite nihilistic, wasn't it, at the time? Where it was like, you know, burn brightly, burn fast and go home and done. You know, like Sid Vicious, burnt fast and burn bright. Too fast and too bright. He was never going to stay alight, right? Um, that's not a lyric, but it should be, right? Anyway, let me just have some tea one second. Thank you. 
so we we have this double this 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 oh bloody my computer's done it again tap tappy tap oh god you know when you can't remember several passwords oh this is this is quality quality stuff this stuff anyway um so I don't know why it does that. I did put it into not going to sleep mode, but I'll check that out. Um, my train of thought. Yeah, so a, 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 a double album. Um, and of course, more expensive as well. Think about this. I think maybe they did it... Well, I don't think they did... Because they released them quite cheaply. The trouble with San Denis is they wanted to release their album. I think it was, I think it was three vinyl. Four, I've got a double. God, I can't remember. Um, one second, I'm going to check that because that's driving me around the bend. So I just looked at my collection. It's a triple album. Um, I must admit I have it I don't play it uh, anyway so they went from a double to a triple they would charge it. one of the troubles with CBS is that they were, would have got angry because the Clash wanted to charge £2.49 or something like that for a triple when it was they would lose money making a triple album for that money I think the same with the double album they wanted to give their fans lots of option lots of different things for uh, a small amount of money because they were about as we saw all the punk movement was about wasn't about uh, ripping off their fa- audience and their fan base so they fill this album up. Now, we'll talk about track by track. I'm not going to go into each in-depth track like I normally do. It's too many to do for this show. But I will go into some... I'll t- we'll, we'll have a chat about the tracks and I'll talk about my favourites. Uh, it, it's a up and down album. I'm sure people out there who love this album are going to say, no, no, it's a golden classic and everything on it is wonderful. And as I said, reaching out and listening to it again for the first time for a little while... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it feels like it has some absolute gems. I mean, some golden standout, wonderful um, new wave reggae driven ska classics. And then there's some, you know, some filler on it. And there's a trouble when you're squeezing out uh, a format, a, a punk format the way it is, trying to grow it, trying to make the album make the person listening to it feel like it's you're getting more for the money and also uh like you're grown up and you're getting a bit more intellectual and more and uh, more uh and more uh, interesting it if it, it just doesn't look it it is better than sandinista let's just be honest it is, it is a, an absolute cracker of an album and it is better than sandinista but it is also not as good as enough rope and it's not as good as the first album and it's and, it, and you know and honestly it probably you could put some of the tracks on this skipping Sandinista and putting it on to Combat Rock quite comfortably um, anyway that's enough for this side for the moment um, I'm going to go and get some fresh tea uh, refresh myself with the album again and listen to it again before I come back to the uh, record the side two I hope you've enjoyed the little chat and intro into the album those that don't know it while i pause to get my tea pause yourself put the album on have a listen um and if you feel so free make some notes and uh, see if you can what you think compared to me i'm sure that you've got better opinions than i have i'm sure you have opinions that are more interesting but this be this will be a good way of um of refreshing yourself to go listen to it if you haven't listened to it before listen to it now anyway enjoy these ads and i will talk to you on the other side about the album tracks bye for now Welcome back, guys, to part two of this week's episode of Heavy Mod Tones with me, your podcast host, Tony Evans. Um, I hope you listened to the album. Like I said, you should do or are going to. London's Calling, the third album by Clash, the founding mem- one of the founding uh, members of the punk movement in the UK. Um, as I said, it's a double album. It's a lot of tracks to get our, um, our teeth into. Uh, it opens... It opens up with um, London's Calling, okay? Classic song. Most of us know the song London's Calling, all right? Um, 
it's it's a it's a it's a a good old fashioned punk athem athematic or anthematic track um fantastic um right, uh, sort of tribal drum beat in the background some staccato type guitars you've got uh, a sing along chorus it, it you know it it's uh it's a, it's all about their um disenfranchised with the city they live in um and about how the the city's been taken over by um by the people they don't like basically it's it it's calling about everyone gets drawn to london it's the center of the universe musically and culturally and it's just about about that basically it's a that's what that's the way i take it anyway not much we can say about that song it, everyone knows heard it most people know it it is the song that when you listen to the clash it's either london calling or um or i said should i stay or should i go you know or white riot you know they're the ones that most people will get yourself drawn to this is side a by the way and then we've got brand new cadillac which is a cover by of a song by uncle taylor and his um, playboys this is one of many covers on this particular album which to me also reeks of I'm running out of ideas now this is not a bad thing to put a cover or two on and it does show your influence and it does create give the audience an understanding of where you're coming from um, musically uh, and culturally and historically but sometimes when you've got more than one on it's saying hey we couldn't write enough original material um don't get me wrong brand new cadillac is one of my favorite songs on this album and it's the second one in uh, it's not a clash song but they really give it that clash feel um that with the with um the the uh it's got a fantastic guitar refrain in it that i think is mick jones is doing uh, remixing the guitar piece on this and of course you know um you know what you can't help but be drawn in by um by joe strummer's vocal i mean sometimes extremely hard to understand um sometimes uh i think he does it deliberately but this one because it's a cover you can you sort of enjoy it's a good it's a very rock and roll song okay it's, it feels like a 50s drive through you know uh, american a bit of americana you know uh, and then you've got jimmy jazz um Jimmy Jazz is, uh, hmm, this is that lounge jazz thing I was talking about, right? Um, and of course, as I've talked before on the show, most of the heritage of modern music in the Western world derives from jazz and the blues, right? And I think that Joe Strummer himself had a big love for jazz, uh, because of his upbringing with his, I think his father was a musical music teacher I, I could be wrong anyway i don't think it's a joe i don't think it's a mick jones thing i think it's definitely a, a, a joe strummer kind of thing um he was that one i feel that he was a more intellectual of the pair and i could be wrong sorry mick if you're listening no offense made right um but joe i think joe was the one that had the jazz i oh, could be the drummer he you know hayden could have also really wanted um uh really wanted a jazz influence um because he, because a jazz drumming is actually very really fun to do but you know but uh yeah it's a it, it's a, got a good um again a good sort of weirdness to it there's a the, the bit in the chorus we goes z z z z you know it's like it's very it's very unpunk in a weird punky kind of way and i think this shows where this where this band was going at that particular time um and where they were trying i think they were it was almost like it feels like it's a um a tester album this is where we might go what what sound do we want to move towards guys is it jazz is it is it rockabilly where do we go um it does show the 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 the, the uh writing block though yeah and then we get into hateful hateful um I like Hateful as a song. It's one of those forgotten tracks on the album. Um, 
it's a very musical track. I'm like, that, well, that's a really weird and wanky thing to say, but it's got a really good glissando, sort of like a um, rising, ascending bass line, a descending bass line, which I find really, really interesting and lovely to play as a bass player. I've played it a few times. Um, and it's because Paul Simonon wasn't a musician. None of them were musicians, really, but... Like he said in his interview, he went to art college to actually do art. He didn't go to art college to join a band, which most people did that. Then they went to art college to form bands. Um, and so he had no idea about bass and stuff like that. So I think come the third album, he suddenly started to get his um, his teeth into the instrument and, and, the, and, the, and the limitations and um, expectations of a bass player. And then, of course, we go straight into Rudy Can't Fail. Um, it is a, I, if I'm going to pull out a song from this album that defines it, I think this is it. It is the ska, reggae, could be ska, more reggae really, um, track on the end side one. And it's, again, I think this is one of Strummer's best vocal lines, best recorded vocal piece. It's... Um, I think he, he stops trying to spit and be angry, and he's and he's he's, he's enjoying the the Caribbean lilt. Oh, that's terrible. I'm gonna get myself offended, offend people there, but the the Caribbean esque or you know the laid back beach far, um thing, the the relax man thing, you know, um, have some you know have a bit of spliff, whatever thing of 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 Jamaican reggae. I think it has that party feel that reggae has. It has that, um, and although I know you're going to point a finger at me and say, say, Tony, reggae has its political aspects, and I think it does. Of course, it does, um, and it and it did, and it still does, and it, and I think that's probably what drew the boys to reggae. Um, also, growing up, I mean, Paul Simon and growing up uh, in you know in and around. Um, Notting Hill and Labrook Grove uh, back in the 60s, you know, where it was a high immigration area, a lot of immigrant Jamaicans um, coming in to the city uh, and coming to the UK at that time, bringing their music with them. And I think that's probably part of it as well, right? But it is, it's one of my, it's a classic, it's, it's a brilliant song. It's got a beautiful lyric to it. Um, it's got a great sing-along thing. It's one of my favourite songs to sing along to. Uh, and then we, we flip that side one over and we come into side two. Now, this song is an earworm for me. Every time I listen to it, I find myself singing this song. I have absolutely no idea what the lyric is. I've read the lyric. I don't understand the lyric because I don't speak Spanish. But Spanish Bombs is... it's 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 almost shouldn't be on this album it, it's almost um just released it as a single if i did release it as a single i reckon it would have made big money um just that really lovely you know spanish bombs in andalusia it's like really oh it's it's so um so fun to listen to it's so fun to sing along to and you know there's that it goes oh my corazon i don't know what that if, if sorry spanish listeners Oh, Spanish speaking people, I don't know what it is. I just enjoy singing along. It's basically about what the song is about is about um that they're trying to tell a comparison between the Spanish Civil War and British back uh holidaymakers because back in the seventies there was this huge push for English people to go to the Costa del Sol, the Costa Brava, you know, cheap package holidays to Spain. Um, and we, I didn't, my family didn't because we were all, but you know, batshit poor. But, um, most people's families did go to Spain for holidays because it was cheap. And, uh, you know, the, there was this old thing, you know, go to Spain and see if you get the, if you don't get the shits. Because, um, back that time, British people weren't used to what the term is, and I'm using air quotes here, greasy food. Um, you know, so, uh, oil and garlic. I mean, the British diet still is and to some extent quite bland and and so they weren't um used to it and it would give them gp tummy uh, uh you know and so it was you know and people would say oh, you know me i've been a bit in spain i've come back and oh, i've got the trots um 
that aside, I don't know why I'm talking about that. But anyway, it's about Spanish, it's about the difference between the Spanish Civil War and our invasion of Spain through um, uh, tourism. It's a fantastic song. It it just makes me fills me full of joy. It fills me full of of happiness. And it, and every time I listen to it, um, and for many years actually, it's been on my top. If you put my Spotify 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 playlist on, Spanish Bombs appears in the top five or top ten of all the stuff I listen to. Because it just every now and again, it just I put it on and I this brings makes a smile to my face. It's just musically lovely. Um, now, and then you get the right profile. Okay. Um, uh, what can I say about it? Not much. I'm going to move on from that. I'm going to move on, right? I'm going to move on. Uh, just it, a filler. Let's just say that. I'm not going to... There are people out there who go, Tony, but it's my favourite song on the album. But I can't... I can't talk about everyone. I, I am limited within a time frame. I don't want to... I want to go a lot of tracks to cover. Not my favourite. Skip, skip. Uh, then Lost in the Supermarket appears. So, amazing side this. What a side this is. Spanish Bombs. And then Lost in the Supermarket. Um, it's a semi-autobiographical song. about Written by the boys about... Um, I think it's Paul Simonon's upbringing. Upbringing? Upbringing in a... Uh, by a single... By living in a, a single room in a poor part of London, um, just, you know, wandering around the streets and shops, uh, dreaming of a future different to what they have. Um, and I think it's, again, that it's got that lovely, really amazing, uh, one of the things that Joe Strummer and the boys have, basically, and Mick Jones, they are a crazily gifted pairing of lyricists. I'll try and say that when you've had a few drinks, all right? Um, they know how to write a song that is beautiful, that is catchy, that is meaningful, and that is, um, is you know, um, narratively interesting. Taking the music aside, the music itself um, is new wave. It, both Spanish bombs, well, Spanish bomb sounds very European. It has a very European sound. Um, but uh, Lost in the Supermarket has a sort of very clashy look at, so I keep it in the mic, a very clashy look at the way new wave is because they were also new wave. This is, now for those who don't know what new wave is, new wave is punk becoming much more pal palatable to the audience and so more pop-like. When punk went from, um, you know, imagery that would shock to pop, it had became new wave. Um, some people find new wave a an offensive term. Some punks find it very upsetting. Um, hardcore punks, but I think, you know, like anything, it has to div diversify and it has to grow up. And as I said before, it burnt so fast, it could never be the same, right? It's only a small period of time. So, New Wave. Um, it's, yeah, it's just got a really, I think Mick Jones sings on it. It's got a great, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting lost for words here. I think it's just one of my favourites. Please go and put it on. I think if you, you can just, Certainly, what a way to end the, end the side, though. Start it with Spanish bombs and end it with... Uh, um, oh, no, it isn't the end of side, too. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm looking at... I've written my... I have not read my notes, probably, people. What a surprise. Um, you then go into Guns of Brixton. So this is... Guns of Brixton is uh, the B-side to Trade in Vain. And it's also the first song that Paul Simonon sings on. Um, he wrote, I believe, uh, again, it is playing into his very strong um, connections with um, the Afro-Caribbean community in the UK in the 70s, 60s, sorry, late 60s and 70s. Um, Brixton being, not knowing if, not, if you don't know from London, Brixton at, well, still is, but was a very, um, a very 
ethnically diverse part of London. So a lot of uh, Jamaicans and Ghanaians and West Indians and all sorts of wonderful people, Sierra Leoneans, all coming to stay. And like most uh, ethnic bases, they'll go to places where they're uh, like-minded are, like Chinatown, and you get places where these, you know, a lot of um, ethnicities to get to get together because they feel strength in numbers. Uh, of course, sadly, very much and very sadly, um, like White Riot, uh, there was a lot of violence towards these wonderful people that are coming into the country and creating. Um, beautiful diversity and bringing cultural differences and um, and art and and wonderful things. They, instead of there is a minority that will find um, them scary, offensive, um, terrifying, uh, you know, bigoted people. Let's not go on. We won't go more further into it than that. We all know what we're talking about. We're talking about xenophobia and racism. Okay, there are these people, and of course, these people instead of acting with words they act with violence and then we get race riots and we had a lot of race riots in Brixton and Toxteth and this is basically around about that guns of Brixton it's sort of a, 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 a look at that a look at the diversity of the city of part of London and how the violence that occurred there um, it is um Sorry, I'm just going to go over here. It is a sadness that I don't want to talk about. But yes, because I, I do remember it as a child. I remember these days and those days, and they were horrible. And I they happened even in, in where I grew up in Hendon. There were, there were race issues, um, particularly in West Hendon, which is a uh, uh, socially, economically um, poorer part of North London. A lot of immigrants went there because rent was cheap, housing was cheap. Um, but again, at the same time, when you've got lack of money, you have lack of education in a lot of places, and this is where the stuff happened. Anyway, but at that aside, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece of music, and I think Paul says he's very proud of it, and I think he should be. And it's one of those, um, again, as I said before, cut the album down to maybe one disc and get this on there. Take the killer out, take the filler out, put this in, make it a killer album. It, it would just be crazy. Um, and then it's followed. Um, we turn over to side three, because that was the end of side two. Um, and we open up with another cover version. Uh, this is Wrong and Boyo by Clive. I've written this down. Alfonso, performed by the... Um, Oh, mate, I have app. I can't read my handwriting. One moment. What a tip. That's so typically me. Um, I need to rewind a bit a second there. Um, I split, I lost a page. I skipped a page. Um, after um, these people look at me going, what's he doing? He doesn't, he doesn't do his research. I do my research. I write it down. Pages get stuck together. Um, after Lost in the Supermarket, we have Clamp Down, um, which is the single that was released early in Australia. Uh, that, again, has a really fantastic... Um, sing along chorus very much a, a pop song to me again it's another um, play on uh, restricting people's thoughts and ideas racism um, xenophobia the governmental control um, you know looking for the clamp down it's again it's a very come on come on it's very um, it's very it's a Joe Strummer and um Nick Jones song, it's very, it, it, it this side actually, take out the right profile, so Spanish Bombs, Lost in the Supermarket, Clamp Down and Guns of Brixton, which is side two, is a cracker, again, a cracker, right, uh, uh, three minutes and 40 seconds long, um, sorry, there's cars racing in the background, my window is open because it's a nice warm day, um, I'm oh, sorry, I missed it, sorry, it was attached, I, my paper, you know, Things happen, but it look brilliant song, cracking up. So, next song, Wrong and Boyo, Clive Alfonso originally performed it by performed by the Rulers, including Stagger Lee. Now, obviously, I don't know who that really is. I could, but it's um, according to Wikipedia, let's do live note taking here. Stagger Lee, known um, is a popular American folk singer. 
Um, so it's a, it's a folk singer, okay? Rong and Boyo does sound, or even though they add a bit of a ska kind of um, knees up kind of fun to the song, it does have a bit of that sort of protest movement feel, um, a bit um, a bit Bob Dylan-y, a bit, um, a bit sort of hippie kind of thing, which is a beautiful contrast for the um, the album itself. Again, a cover song. Yes, they had their twist to it, but, uh, you know, does it need to be there? No, I don't think it does. I think it's, um, you're getting one of the weaker songs in the album. And then we go on to Death or Glory, a crack. I keep saying crack up, right? But this, Spanish Bombs, um, lost, in the, uh, lost in the Supermarket, Clamp Down Guns at Brixton, and Death or Glory, uh, I really can't fail, um, are pure clash classics um again it's not like like spanish bombs it's an air I, I was in, having a shower the other day and i had this album on while i was reviewing it you know getting back my head around it and i'm going i could not get my head off of singing the bloody lyrics to death or glory um again it's got a great sing-along you know death or glory just another story it's 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 really a beautiful movement from the un- inaudible stuff that came off of the first album t- to the lyric in this one and it, it sort of you know it's like the spit and vitriol of the first the same kind of vitriol on this song but with much more eloquence and it's it's a sing-along again put this out as a single I don't they probably wouldn't have done because of the name Death or Glory but a Cracker oh my god um, one of my favourite songs on the album. Then we follow with Coca 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 Cola, which is a song about, um, you know, as it says, really, it's about uh, consumerism, American consumerism. Again, filler. Move on. Not a great fan. Um, the card cheat. This. What? What can I say about the card cheat? Gosh, it's um, it's like something that would be in in the credits of a, of a western. Um, it, it, it's got this um, man in the, what's his name the man in black the um, you know a boy called Sue you know him it's got it's got that feel to it you know um, you know Johnny Cash it's got sort of a Johnny Cash feel to it um, which you know again is that musical diversity that you've get that you get with this this album that makes this album um sort of one of the one of the most weird curiosities of the punk era was you wouldn't get it before this I don't think you wouldn't have got it and you won't get it after either I think this is a, a one of those um, albums that only punk could make and only British punk could make I think um, because they really show on their sleeves their um, true um, diversity and love for music that isn't just rock and roll in three minutes and that's the end of side three wow okay so we're catching our breath my god we've had three bloody sides of this album where can we go from here what is going to happen now um and i'm gonna speed through these quickly because again these don't do anything for me lovers rock is um the first part of side four then Four Horsemen, Four Horsemen, it, it, musically, yeah, I'm not down, um, as I said, you, I mean, luckily these don't hang around, four minutes, two minutes, fifty, and three minutes, um, not something that, they're all written by Jones, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know, um, Mick Jones wrote the card sheet, and, you know, he does that and then comes along and does this and I'm thinking oh okay but then we move after those three kind of blandish tracks to um, track four on this side which is another cover song Um, Revolution Jackie Rock um, by Edwards Danny Ray originally performed by Danny Ray and the Revolutionaries Um, I'm not it's five minutes and thirty long um (sighs) It's a cover song. Um, it, it's they had a they had a scarish twist to it. There's a nice bit of punkiness. Uh, there is that, you know, 
Topper's um, drumming on it is probably the best on the album. But it, it is, again, another cover. I don't really want to talk about this one because um, I'd rather you listen to them and then get your own mind on these covers. I just I, I feel a little bit cheated slightly by this too many covers on an album. And then we end with Train in Vain. As I said, one of the considered one of the top 220 songs of all time in the um, uh, in the um, hard um, what's it called uh, rock and roll magazine um, top 500 um, songs, and it it's it is brilliant because it's a real bastardization of several musical forms. Um, I'll read what it says here. On the original version of the album, Train in Vain was not listed on the sleeve, nor the label of the record itself, but a sticker indicated the track was affixed to the outer cellophane wrapper. It was also scratched into the vinyl in the runoff area, um, the fourth side of the album. Later editions included the song on the track listing. So, if you've got an album where it's not mentioned, it's one of the very first, I think it's the first hundred, maybe one thousand copies of it, where it was a hidden Easter egg kind of track. And then it was released, um, because it was released as a single, they then put it on to the printed cover sleeve. I've got one of those where it's not mentioned, and I've also got one where it's mentioned. And um, uh, let's see what, what we can say about this song, okay? I mean, the cover's brilliant, the single. It's it's the cover of the album. It's Paul Simon and smashing his guitar. Um Again, recorded in Wessex Studios, released on the top of February 1980. A B-side, London Calling. What a B-side. Amazing, right? But they again, have already released London Calling, so a bit of a cheek, really, isn't it? Let's be honest. A bit of a, bit of a for a band who doesn't want to rip people off, a bit of a rip-off. Um, now, in the US, the title's expanded, Trend in Vain, Stand By Me, because it does have that and stand by me to dun, 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 dun lyric going on um, that's sort of in the chorus, is dominant in the chorus, um, and to, to confuse, to stop the, the confusion between the Benny King signature song "Stand by Me" and that they had to put "Train Invade" on it. Um, sorry, Americans, I know that's a bit silly, but some it's a bit odd to me that you had to do that. But again, not a big band in America at the time, not a huge, huge band, so it would have been confusing to some people. Um, let's see here. The track was, he says here, that Mick Jones says, the track was like a train rhythm, and there was once again the feeling of being lost. Um, there was this sense of, there was a sense of loss, isn't there, in this album? If you look across the, the, uh, and, and confusion, him lost in the supermarket, not where he's going, London calling, where everyone's drawing them in and not knowing where they are. Bombs of Brixton, which is basically guns of Brixton, which is basically a loss of uh, of innocence because of violence. Um, Mick Jones split up with guitarist. I I didn't know that he was actually. I mean, he was. He was de- he was dating Viv Abertine um, at the time, and the song would have been about probably about loss as well around that. Um, the, the song has been interpreted to be about Jones' volatile relationship with Albertine, who commented, "I'm really proud to have inspired that." The, but often the, he won't admit to it. He used to get the train to my place in Shepherd's Bush and I would let him in. He was beating on the doorstep. That was cruel. The couple separated around the time of recording of the sessions of London Calling. So, um, you know, so Vive Abertine was in the slits, I believe, the wonderful female punk band. Um, and it also the album is an absolute cracker. Cut is an amazing album. If you can get the original one, I've got with them all with uh, bare chested and covered in mud. It was very controversial. Um, it's, it's a cracker of an album. Um, then in the charts, it got to 62 in Canada, 26 in New Zealand, 23 in US. Um, it doesn't say we've gotten to in the UK. I think it pretty didn't really chart, to be honest with you, because uh, the album didn't do big numbers either. Um, and that's it. That's that's. That's my take on um, London Calling. It is a mixture of an album. There are people here who listen to this program now that will go, I listened to it, Tone, and I didn't see what you're talking about, or what are you talking about? It's the most amazing thing um, since sliced bread, and that's probably true. Oh, pardon me, I just smacked the mic stand with my 
book to a lot of people. I just think it's that problematic. I, we're growing up from teenagers to adults, um, and we want to, like you do when you get older, as you get older, you want to show your, um, you want to show the world your influence. You want to say, hey, look, this is what makes me, me. This is what makes me a complex human being. This is what makes me a complex musician. This is what makes me um, an individual because to be an individual, you have to at some time have been um, part of the crowd and to break away. And so they want to show that they do have their allegiances. And yet, yes, where I said it's got a handful of, of, of outrageously amazing songs, probably the best they've ever the, the band ever recorded. Um, but at the same time, unfortunately, it's full of too many cover versions, which is great for people who don't know those songs and those musicians. So I, you know, I'm sure in their corner, in their defence, they're saying, "Well, yeah, but we're we're bringing this music to the world, and it's probably forgotten music, like Clapton was doing with the blues in the '60s with Cream. He was bringing." Um, ethnic um, um, African American blues to the white streets of London and and the UK and Europe. Um, yes, I, I'm sure you could shout that in your defence, but at the same time, make an album of that instead. Um, don't I don't want to I don't want my album to be four, three or four cover songs. I mean, it's just a little bit too much for me. Um, but I said, well, I hadn't. When I first heard this album, back when I was maybe 12 or 13, I had no idea that these ba- these songs were covers um, until I looked at the album sleeve. Um, and the, I think back even then, I was a little bit, oh, okay. Um, now, I could have gone the other way. I could have gone, wow, I'm going to now listen to more of this particular band or this particular movement or this particular, uh, I love it so much. But I didn't because I was a snobby punk and I wanted to hear more um, Guns of Brixton, more um, Death or Glory, you know, more, more more of that. That's what I wanted. Um, and I'm sure that's probably what hampered the, the, the them becoming even bigger than they were because they wanted so desperately, it appears to me, to diversify um, in a time when... Um, I mean, the wonderful thing about punk is that a lot of punks were into diversity, and it was about, um, it wasn't, as I said before, all about violence and spitting on each other and smacking each other around and, and, and aggression. It, there was a lot of intelligence in amongst the musical coniacenti. But I think also, probably 50% of their audience was that um, nihilistic, um, you know, skinhead, and it didn't. It didn't do well. Look at what happened when um, a classic band like Sham 69, you know, they weren't a skinhead band. They weren't into violence. You know, um, Jimmy Percy was what is a, a peace-loving, um, intellectual man who loves diversity. Yeah, his audience all became skinheads doing Nazi salutes in his front row. And he even said, you keep doing that, we, we won't... We won't um, appear on stage and they didn't he left he just wouldn't come back i got physically well i didn't get attacked like i got away from him but i was attacked almost attacked by uh, a german skinhead uh, he was no just because he was german this isn't going to go german germans this is just part of the story he was german um um he had glasses i remember and he was a skinhead and, and i was at um i was going to see this the sham at the Swan in Fulham, and they didn't turn up, and I kicked the sign over because I was a bit annoyed. Come all the way across London, and uh, he saw me. He must have thought I was having a go at the band, and he's chased after me. He had a bicycle chain and everything, swinging it around. I luckily, anyone knows Fulham train station. You got two sets of stairs that go down onto the platform. I sort of sprinted down those, got on the train, and just as I got onto the train, the doors shut, and he smacked the train doors with the bike chain. Um, that's the kind of audience that, that they unfortunately had, and that's what a lot of the um, punks sort of thought they had to do and were. And, you know, it was a place for aggression because at that time music wasn't as aggressive. You'd had your, um, you had your prog rock and your, your heavy rock and your um, 
your folk stuff and and there was all this pent up energy and anger and then instead of using it correctly these thugs um reached out reached out that way and as i was just saying so i'm, I'm sidetracking diversifying in my opinion but that's what's happening so they didn't influence i don't know if they influenced lots of people with these with these songs they put on the album i personally would have would have now as an older man who's about to turn 50 mm -hmm, um would like to say that i'd love that on a separate album come on guys release an album of your influences man it would make a cracking album um this sort of was an album of their influences because they used different musical forms and terms and signatures and motifs and time signatures and notation and you know glissandoing up uh, uh, pieces of music but was it the right time to do it possibly not was it brave of them yes um i think the clash and this is going to this is really gonna um sort of set the cats amongst the pigeons here i genuinely think the clash as a band genuinely were maybe two albums possibly three outside that done um because they they had too much to say individually and not enough time and ability combined and enough and also not not enough time uh, not enough uh, money um and and experience to get the their vision across collectively anyway there's me being intellectual about this particular album i hope you enjoyed the album i hope you enjoyed the the review i said i'd spread a few cost few some of the singles i saw i got the clamp down thing mixed up again my notes in my notebook i write them down and then they get stuck and stuff and i just cross pages and, um but as I said, go and listen to the album if you haven't listened already. Love, I'd love to hear what your opinion is on the album um, and on the songs, your favourite songs on the album. If you like the album, you might hate The Clash. Um, you might go, I can't do it. Uh, either way, who cares? As long as, you, as, long as you're trying it. Uh, I'll leave you a little shout out. April's coming up and it's going to be my 100th show. April's going to be in a weird month. I'm doing Women in Women in Rock. For April, I was going to do women in metal, but I think it's too restrictive. I want to do women in rock slash metal for April. There will be four shows, but there will be a fifth show chucked in on the week of my hundredth show. It will be my celebrating my hundredth show because um, I don't want to. I've already set these plans in motion for the four shows for April, so I will chuck in. I didn't realize it was my hundredth show coming up when I was writing all the shows. Um, my plan for April. Um, are typically me anyway i hope you've enjoyed listening to it i hope you enjoyed the show I'll talk to you soon guys um ciao for now